test, wet test, one, two, three, four, test, test, captioning test.
Good morning. Welcome to this morning session on data, environmental and climate data. Um, thanks for making it early. Uh, we have one apology today. Fernando Belda, who was one of the speakers on the list, is not feeling well and he will not be able to come. But that should not be a problem. We have two of his colleagues here and I think we will still be able to, to learn what we came for here about data in, in this context. Uh, very briefly, my name is Dejan Dincic. I'm Diplo's lecturer. I also work as a consultant on digital transformation. And today we have uh, with us uh, Pei Lang Shi, director of WMO Information System. And we have Stefan Boinski, scientific officer Satellite Utilization and Products Division, WMO Space Program Office. We also have Barbara Rosen Jakobson, who's uh, doing remote moderation. We hope to have some remote participants. And we have Philip, who is providing hosting and uh, for the remote participation and for us in the room. Uh, Data, big data, this we, we listen, we hear a lot about it, we read a lot about it, it's become a buzzword in recent times. Uh, most of the time we, we hear about data being generated from big internet platforms now, that is something that is in the focus. But actually we are also told often that um, internet of things and <clears throat> new developments will generate even bigger amounts of data and this will change our future. However, there are organizations for which this is already a reality, who have been working with data, with sensors, with collecting massive amounts of data and processing them for a long time. And one of such organizations based in Geneva is World Meteorological Organization. And they collect data from satellites, from aircrafts, from land stations, and um, you can imagine the, the, the volume of this data. So today we'd like to, to learn from their experience to see how it can be used or um, what we can learn from that for other contexts. But in, we start with the basic explanations of what kind of data they work with and how they use it. There are questions that you may have. Uh, for me, a particularly interesting question would be what kind of capacities are needed globally to use to benefit from data and because that is not often talked about today but I, we, if, we are, if we want to make sure that <clears throat> most people benefit from this I think this is one of the questions that interests me. So without further ado I would like to ask uh, Stefan to start with his presentation and then we'll have a brief Q&A after this first presentation, then we'll have the second presentation by Pei Lang, and then we will have more questions and time for discussion. Stefan, please. Uh, thank you very much. As you say, uh, big data, whatever that really means, is a bread and butter job for the meteorological community. Um, as back as late as early as in 1853, the predecessor of WMO was founded on the realization that data measurements of our planet are required globally to make sure that, in this case, um, military vessels have a safe passage over the seas. Um, and so, for the meteorological community, dealing with large amounts of data is a, is a routine affair. They do this every day. But these data are also highly structured. They are very well described. Um, they are not unstructured data such as, um, let's say, Google search uh, searches. Um, so that's the big difference. Although we also see the emergence of citizen observatories, you know, taking the temperature using your smartphone, and there are investigations on how to make use of such data um, for meteorological applications. So without further ado, in this talk I will focus on the contribution that satellites, um, which are artificial objects that revolve in an orbit around a planetary object, in this case our planet Earth, 
contribute to weather and climate applications. So just one slide on what WMO is. It's a specialized agency of the United Nations based uh, here with headquarters in Geneva with 191 member states. And it is the UN system's authoritative voice on the state and behavior of the Earth's atmosphere, its interaction with land and oceans, the weather and climate it produces, and the resulting distribution of water resources. We work mostly with national meteorological services and academia to make sure this is happening. I decided to show you this slide, which it gives you a snapshot of the situation in the Atlantic in September of this year. It was um, one of the most active hurricane seasons in the Atlantic. I'm sure you've heard the news about it. This shows Hurricane Maria and Tropical Storm Jose approaching the uh, Caribbean and the coast of the US. And information like this from satellite, but also from buoys in the ocean, from stations at land, is critical to help um, forecast the track of these massive systems, which pose an important threat to uh, lives and livelihoods, uh, as you heard in the news. At the bottom here, you see the uh, storm tracks of all the storms in the 2017 season. And forecasters in operational centers 24-7 are monitoring this. and and forecasting those storms. And it is, it is a matter of hours or minutes to get these data in time to the right people, to the right computers to forecast these storms. And that's by no means trivial. As you can see at the bottom here, this is track of Hurricane Sandy in 2012, a very unusual track. If you don't see any of these tracks in 2017. And it was due to these advanced numerical weather prediction models that the landfall of Sandy in New York City could be predicted with four days in advance, which gives very precious time for emergency services and, and, and disaster prevention authorities to react accordingly and to evacuate where needed. So while the, the loss of lives and livelihoods was tragic in the, in the Caribbean and the US, uh, it would have been much, much larger without these predictions. So significant investments have been made by countries all around the world in what we call the weather and climate data value chain, which um, goes from the observations of the state of the planet, telecommunication, and my colleague Pell Young will talk about this in more detail. So quickly get the data from where it's being measured to, to the right place. Processing and forecasting um, these data into something uh, that is looking like a forecast of weather in three, five, ten days. And then the services that you know from your TV program and from your smartphone. Um, just the observations, estimated cost globally around five to ten billion US dollars annually by all countries. Um, it's often cited as a, and this system, this value chain is often cited as a, a primary example for global planning through the UN and WMO. Um, also referred to as the World Weather Watch. It's driven by advances in science and technology, as we see today. Um, it was started in the early 60s when the first satellites were available and also when global prediction models came, came about. But countries didn't just invest in this because they felt this is an exciting opportunity. They also saw the, the real benefits in in investing and in improving forecasts. I mentioned the, the shipping vessels, but there are many, many other applications of this, and I'll show this in my slides. Establishment of World Weather Watch was triggered by a speech by US President J.F. Kennedy in the UN Assembly at the time. So satellites are supporting these services in weather, climate, and environment through many means. So Earth observation means you have a sophisticated camera up there, um, and it takes pictures or other measurements of the planet. But there are also these navigation services driven by GPS satellites and Galileo these days, which enable you to geolocate um, whatever is happening, and you use this every day in your smartphone that you know where you are. So this is enabled by satellites too. Thirdly, telecommunication services. So if you want to make a phone call on the North Pole, you use the satellite for that, for example, or if you're on the oceans. And fourthly, space weather and situational awareness, which basically means um, we would like to know what the sun is doing and how it impacts systems on Earth. I'll focus mostly on Earth observation in this talk. 
Uh, this is not the complete picture of all the satellites that are orbiting uh, above our heads, but it's, it's sort of the, the workhorses, as we say, um, that, in, that provide the data for the meteorological community. We call this the space-based global observing system. And these satellites, uh, this is not to scale, um, these are operated by these agencies from countries around the world, uh, listed there below, coordinated through WMO and the Coordination Group for Meteorological Satellites. And I have a web link here which gives you information on all the satellites by all the countries and systems uh, that are uh, currently flying or planned. Um, some people may not know what a satellite actually looks like, so I just put a picture in of a typical one. Um, this is a European satellite um, flying at about 900 kilometers above Earth. Uh, so in, th in theory you could see it every day, but it's kind of hard to spot. So this is easier to say. It's, it's about the size of a car and about, weighs about 800 kilos, but there are much smaller satellites these days launched by academia, universities, even private companies now are embarking on this, nanosatellites, Terabella, Planet, all those companies. So what is it all used for? Um, this shows um, the satellite at the, at the top here, the satellite data sets that are used at one of the most, um, one of the world's leading weather prediction centers, a European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting based in Reading, UK. So um, they're using many, many more satellites um, over time. Um, it's not trivial to just, you know, assimilate these data in your models to make them useful. But the effects are clear. So at the bottom you see um, the quality of forecasts which has improved over time. So if things go up, it means forecasts are getting better. That means you compare a forecast, you do a forecast now f f over the next three days and then you wait three days and you compare what's really happening. And you correlate the two. And that gives you this graph. And so the forecasts have improved um, day three, day five, day seven over the past um, 30 years and uh, that's largely due to the contributions of satellites, but also due to advances in modeling uh, the Earth system. And if you just take the red curve, D plus five, uh, now, um, you can see it's about at the, at the uh, height where D, D plus three was about 15 years ago. This means a five-day forecast today is as good as a three-day forecast 15 years ago. Okay? So we're making about one day per eight years. And I wouldn't extrapolate that forever, of course. <laughs> but uh, that's just an indication of progress in our discipline. And also the, the bands here, this shows northern and southern hemispheres. So the, the skill of forecasts has it converged. It's because we now have data from areas where there's not many observations, so like on the, in the oceans and in the southern hemisphere. So uh, forecasts in the southern hemisphere are now as good as in the northern hemisphere, which used to be very different. Uh, just another example, El Nino, it's a, it's a major seasonal weather phenomenon that you may have heard of, affecting weather patterns around the world. And you can see uh, this from satellite also. This is the anomaly in the tropical uh, Pacific seen from an old ocean altimeter. Um, but also another application is uh, aircraft. So if you fly across the Pacific, uh, you better know what the volcanoes are doing in the Aleutians Islands across just off Alaska. They're very active volcanoes and there's lots of flights and you'd better know if a volcano is erupting because then you, you may want to de you know, reroute your, your flight pattern. And the yellow here is false colors, but it shows the presence of volcanic ash and you would not want to th fly through this. Taking a real holistic view of the Earth, this is Apollo 11, 1968. We'd like to know what we need to measure uh, to, take a, to get the whole picture of the planet. And a program called Global Climate Observing System, which is co-sponsored by WMO, they have defined essential climate variables, about 55 of them, which are recommended by, to all countries of the world to be measured on a routine, systematic and long-term basis. And the, import, the point of this slide is to show you it's not just about the atmosphere, it's also about the oceans, it's about the sea ice, it's about the cold regions, it's about land surfaces, and it's also ultimately about what humans do. So we have to observe all these things on a routine basis. 
and the satellites provide a major contribution. So this is the list of essential climate variables as we have it today. And in yellow, you see the areas where satellite observations come in very strongly. And just one example how it's been used. So if you are a coastal city, a mega city, you are interested in sea level rise, correct? So if you want to protect your ports and your, your settlements, you better know how sea level is rising uh, over the, over uh, in the future. And on the top right, on the top left, you see regional sea level change over the past 25 years. So red means change up to one centimeter per year and other colors mean a bit less than that. So it's not like in a bathtub where water just goes up. It's, it's very variable depending on ocean currents and the gravity field. If you know that and you know on the top right the city allowance levels, which means um, the degree to which the cities can adapt their ports and their settlements and to make them um, more protected, then you can calculate how much it will cost per year each of these cities to maintain such levels of protection. And just one more example. Um, so no one is living there really, but we say what happens at the poles doesn't stay at the poles. And so the satellites are a unique way of monitoring what's happening in this vast Antarctic continent and its ice sheets. And what you see here is vice velocity, so the, the, the velocity with which glaciers move. And uh, you can use that as a proxy for melting of the ice sheet and its effect on sea level. We've also mapped um, what Earth observation can do to support the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And here are the 17 goals, um, which are underpinned by targets and indicators. And on the right, you see uh, to what extent uh, Earth observation data helps to map and provide information about these things. So for example, population distribution, of course you have national statistics bureaus and and census and all these things. But you can also see where people live uh, quite nicely from space and you, you can uh, make your, draw your conclusions uh, on that. So this is available and, and can be used. I'd like to talk a bit more about data now. I would say a or maybe the key engine behind the progress in our discipline has been a free and unrestricted international exchange of data. And that is by no means something uh, taken for granted. Uh, in the mid-90s, this resolution, it's a formal statement by member, member states of WMO, uh, was, was approved. And um, it, 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 it made sure that it, it, it creates a regime within which all countries can define which data they want to exchange. Uh, it's called essential data. And for which data there are some restrictions for exchange. So this flexibility enables each country to map whatever they have as national regulation into what WMO wants. But this has been the engine behind progress in our discipline. So every day, every second, you have gigabytes of data that are exchanged automatically, routinely, and in standardized formats, and that can be used for weather forecasting based on this resolution. It's, it's regularly under threat um, because of needs and intentions to commercialize data, but uh, so far this, this holds true. Unrestricted means non-discriminatory and without charge. Just one slide on what we do to help countries to make use of this vast amounts of information. We have just four items here. We have region-based satellite user groups, so in each we divide the world up into regions, six regions, and in each region we have people who are expert in using satellite data for meteorological and climate services, and we bring them together regularly. We provide training to them through distance learning techniques and, and other things uh, to keep them up to speed on uh, what's happening in space and how they can use these data effectively. We also maintain online portals and um, issue guidance and best practices. Looking ahead, just some thoughts on what um, we see as, as trends that will determine our discipline. Of course, we will have advances in modeling science. So we would like to simulate even better how the planet is changing. And in order to do that, we want to have higher spatial resolution of our models. So it's no use, it's, let's say if you want a weather forecast for Geneva, it's no use if you have 
information only every 100 kilometers. It's quite coarse, especially if you have such a topographic, topographic terrain here. So you want high resolution down to five, two kilometers. And also you want to uh, consider many more factors in your, you want to be even more realistic to, to model what's happening. Um, so this is where we see things going, but this has implications on computing and on data because the models um, today we have roughly five to the five times ten to the power of nine um, variables to consider to run such a model every day. That's the top right box here. But the models will improve, and we'll, they will have many more grid points. Uh, top right, you see sort of how you know we model what's happening in the Earth. Many more levels, which means layers of the atmosphere, and many more variables. People want to know more and more how is how is the planet changing. You know, today you have a forecast for temperature and rainfall. Maybe tomorrow you want to know how is my tree changing, how is my soil changing, my my f my agricultural fields, um, the lake, and so on. So. This is driven by societal demand for information, but also by, by science. So you will have a factor of 2,000 more data per time step. On the observation side, on the left here, you, we also will have more data, uh, more satellites, more instruments, higher resolution. But the increase in data is less. It's maybe a factor of 10 to 50, uh, not 2,000. And the modeling centers need to cope with this. So this is a graph from, from a, a, a major modeling center. And they are simply running out of energy to run these models. Um, uh, so on the bottom you have model resolution and on, on the, on the y-axis you have the number of computer cores and the power consumption needed to run these models. And you can easily see that um, we are getting into an area, if we have a, if a model of five kilometer resolution in 2025 and a single model, uh, we will use about 100 megawatts, well, 50 megawatts. So you need almost your own power station to run this. Um, it cannot be easily delegated to the cloud because that would probably take too much time. We need very high performance computing to do this. So, um, and, and Moore's law, the, the scalability of semiconductors is also at its end, I would say. So um, we need new approaches to modeling. That's the key message here to cope, with, to cope with this and to meet the demands of society. My last slide, so the future trends that we see. So we need, we need some kind of data thinning or conversion while preserving main information content in, in the data that we use and exchange because the volumes are just getting too large. We need to look at how cloud computing is, can be useful. It's already being done. There are pilot projects in this, in this area. Um, traditionally, the data was sent to somebody and they could use some, you could do something with it. Because the data volumes are getting so large and bandwidth is always a problem and a limitation. We're increasingly seeing that people bring their code to the data, okay? And then you calculate whatever you want on the data in the cloud or somewhere, and then you get results which are not as, you know, then the data volumes are, are smaller. We talk about analysis-ready data. Um, this means, let's say, if you want to cook Cordon Bleu, um, some cooks, they want just the best ingredients and they know how to cook it. Other people just want the ready menu, okay? And it depends what you want. So we, we were sometimes accused we are too academic, too elitist, so our data cannot be readily used. People just want to know how much rain there is without asking many questions. In our community, we tend to say it's not that simple. So we need some processing, we need some science. So there is a, you know, a debate around this. Where do you... Where do you sort of release your data to somebody to make use of it in an intelligent way? The model of global unrestricted data exchange needs preservation. We are totally convinced of that. Um, and we have working groups to work on principles of critical satellite data and, and other data to preserve this resolution 40. We need new approaches to weather modeling because the end of Moore's law is nigh, as we, as we say. A big challenge is as in many other technical areas, how to reduce the digital divide, infrastructure and human capacity, how can we make, it, make sure it keeps pace with data and modeling advances. 
Um, certification of weather and climate services. So this is, should we have a role here or not? This means if you have your smartphone and your app and you get a weather forecast, anyone can do this. Should there be any kind of quality control or certification, a, a stamp of approval by a, by a med service to make sure, you know, to give people confidence that this is useful. If you plan your barbecue and it, it rains, that's maybe not such a big deal. But if there are serious warnings and there is confusion in the population because, you know, one app says this, the other app says that, you know, who is right? So the, the, it's a debate, who has the authority to say this? And lastly, commercialization of the weather enterprise. So there are new actors entering the field. Um, it's, mu it's much easier today to access space. Um, companies want to commercialize data. It's a debate that is ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. This was uh, really interesting. <laughs> I actually, I have my own list of many questions here, but uh, I wonder, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. There will be remote. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I got a question. Uh, my name is Emir Hartato. I'm from Peta Benchana, but I also uh, have a uh, educated in, in GIS, Geographic Information Science. So I pretty much understand about data numbers and stuff. But, you know, we got numbers and data, we got beautiful maps uh, for us, but how, how it can be meaningful for others is still a challenge, yeah? And so far, uh, what, what kind of efforts so, so far that WMO has been done to deliver this data to vulnerable community? That's first. And what about the security, you know, the, the, the data security, because, you know, satellite can be hacked and also, uh, infrastructures can be disrupted and also data can be manipulated. How do you deal with that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the delivery, so in principle, uh, the data are made available freely to the community. Some nations have more restrictive data policies, others are to totally open. Um, most of the data, as soon as it's no longer time critical, is available on the web for anyone to use. Uh, satellite agencies are more and more moving in this area of free and open data access. So uh, whatever you saw on my slide with the satellites, those data are generally freely available, especially they lose value with time. So the, the archive data are usually freely available. If it's very fresh data, it sometimes has restrictions. Um, we also have science groups that help us um, translate the, this complexity into something more simple. So, for example, rainfall is a big interest by many, many communities. We have an, a science group that just looks at that and compares different estimates of rainfall um, to help now casting, to help emergency services um, in case of heavy rainfall events, for example, or droughts. So that's, that's, we maintain science groups and we foster data exchange. That's the first question. The second one, Yes, it is a challenge. It's, um, in some countries, the agency running satellites is part of the defense ministry. They are used to these kinds of threats, but it's certainly a challenge um, how infrastructure can be protected. And Peliang, my colleague Peliang will talk about this a little more and we have it as a discussion point as well. Thank you. Any other questions? No. <clears throat> when you say uh, this data is I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. When you say data is available freely to the communities, but also some nations have a restrictive or more restricted policy on um, this, the data that is exchanged internationally is first forwarded to national services, right? And then they decide what to share at the national level or not. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, they decide what what they share at the national level. Usually, it's 
uh, shared immediately with other governmental agencies, so it's largely under government control. But some, in some countries, whatever is shared in the government is immediately available to the general public and to any users. In other countries, it's more restricted. But because of the global nature of the internet, would it be possible for people to use, to access the same information from other uh, sources abroad if they can't get it locally? That is already happening in some happening. cases, yeah. And are there some interesting examples of uh, communities using this information in, in ways that were not maybe foreseen or planned? Um, so some kind of crowdsourcing applications that you've seen that may that are interesting? Of course, there are lots of many things like this happening. Um, you know, people build their own service and um, make their own predictions almost. You can run a little weather model on your laptop these days. You can forecast your local weather. You can um, you can investigate pollution, for example, pollution levels in your local community, air quality. People are doing this. Um, for example, if, if you want to assess the impact of air pollution on agriculture or on an ecosystem, you can, you can do that very locally. And that doesn't have to be done by the Met Service. You said one of the challenges is models and the computing power we need for them. Are there any promising emerging new models or principles for modeling? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's called, uh, one approach is called GPU rather than CPU, so central processing unit and graphical processing unit. So you, you delegate some of the processing to a, to a different way of, um, right. you know, processing and, and also architecture and proximity of computer systems becomes more and more important. So you have to be very, you know, you have to code your, your programs in a way that the data isn't moved around a lot. So you, you have to process where the data is physically almost on your motherboard to make that happen. So the, the architecture of the computer system becomes more and more important. Thank you. There are no other questions for now. Um, I think we can move to the next presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Pei Liang Shi. I'm from WMO. Uh, my uh, my uh, branch uh, is the WMO Information System. Uh, we do uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, what we do is all about uh, um, facilitating and promoting the uh, technical collaboration among our members uh, in data exchange, uh, data sharing, uh, providing. Uh, uh, setting standards on data, uh, so uh, I will I will show you a few slides uh, on uh, the technical systems uh, that uh, WMO um, coordinates uh, among members. So, uh, as uh, as my uh, colleague uh, Stephen uh, showed uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, where WMO coordinates uh, several. Um, Global networks, uh, which is uh, implemented by our member countries, um, the uh, the most I would say the most expensive uh, the, uh, system is the uh, global observing system. So we have uh, here we have a uh, uh, WIGOS, which stands for WMO Integrated Global Observing System, which is composed of all sorts of. Uh, observing uh, technology systems, sat including satellites, radar, up air sounding, uh, buoys on, on the ocean, and all sorts of them. So it's, it's a very complex uh, system. You can imagine how much data those systems are generating uh, in real time and, uh, and uh, uh, how complex those data are in format. 
and levels of uh, quality. And so how to make sure that uh, they are of uh, good quality, enough quality for our uh, data, later data, data processing systems and for our scientists, for our forecasters to use. Uh, and how to how to um, uh, maintain this system in a sustainable way, uh, uh, so getting them uh, integrated uh, into a whole uh, picture uh, is uh, the uh, target of this uh, WIGOS. So we have a uh, we have a uh, WIS and GTS WMO Information System slash GTS. GTS stands for Global Telecommunication System, which is uh, one of the one of the key uh, uh, components of uh, World Weather Watch, as uh, Stefan mentioned a few minutes ago. So we have uh, this WIS and GTS is about data exchange. So how to make data freely and uh, unrestrictedly, uh, in, in, a, in a free and unrestricted way uh, to, uh, to flow among our members, to make sure that each member of WMO has a, a share of global data, uh, that's what they want to use. And at, at the upper co up right corner, we have a GDPFS, which stands for Global Data Processing and Forecasting System. Namely, though this is composed of a, 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 a long list of uh, forecasting centers. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the world, uh, well, uh, let's, let me quote one of the one, one of this is uh, one of the uh, most famous uh, one is uh, uh, based in, in Europe. It's the European mi mi uh, Medium Range Weather Forecasting Centre, uh, based in southern England. So we have uh, all the systems to to underpin uh, the efforts of our of our member countries to deliver weather, climate, and uh, hydrological services. So a closer look at the GTS structure, you can see uh, this is a hierarchical, hierarchical uh, structure, which is uh, the result of uh, evolution since the early 1960s. So the very beginning years, the uh, start of the World Weather Watch. So we have uh, at the corner uh, a, a, a few centers uh, uh, interlinked by the uh, main telecommunication network. And then the, uh, we have uh, national centers, we have uh, regional telecommunication hubs, RTHs, and uh, each country, namely each country, uh, has uh, run a, a national meteorological center which is connected to this uh, network. Imagine the complexity of this network. The, what we are proud of at WMO is that well before the age of internet, uh, we have a very, we, we already have a sophisticated network connecting, in theory, all the members by all sorts of uh, te telecommunication means. Look at this uh, chart, which is uh, for the date uh, a few years ago, uh, which is which is only showing part of the GTS, which is uh, in Asia. So you have, uh, you have, well, you can see. Well, this is not uh, that. Uh, this is too complex, maybe. Yes. It's, it's based on the uh, legacy technology, tele telegraph, namely. But uh, since the, the uh, uh, beginning of, uh, uh, well, since the beginning of the internet age, so this chart is evolving, and uh, we, we now have a, a much more, uh, well, uh, we have a flatter structure. Uh, that is uh, what we call now a, a, the uh, WIS uh, network, which is uh, uh, cutting down the levels of uh, hierarchy between different levels of centers, uh, because we are benefiting from the development of internet. Internet is crucial to our business. Internet is connecting all our bits and systems uh, stations uh, together. So internet is, uh, is uh, the very crucial infrastructure that we uh, base our systems on. So WMO information system, what is the difference between the, uh, WIS and GTS? WIS is trying to open up GTS. As you can see, GTS is more uh, oriented to uh, professional centers, uh, operational centers. So. Uh, we now uh, we, we have uh, much uh, more data, or much uh, more kind of data. So, and, and, and our users uh, want to get access to those data in an easier way. Uh, so, how do how do we make this happen? So, we we we, we started um, uh, uh, 
some 10 years ago, uh, this uh, implementation of the uh, World uh, uh, WMO Information System, which is uh, composed of uh, three categories of centers, National Center, NC, uh, Data Collection and uh, Production Centers. Uh, those are the major, well, most of the, uh, the, uh, the major data centers, uh, meteorological climate data centers in the world are in this category. For example, the UMET set, as, uh, yeah, as, as uh, Stefan mentioned just now, and one of the forecasting centers where they, they produce a lot of uh, uh, global pr uh, prediction, uh, uh, gl global weather forecasting products is the ECMWF. So those are the, uh, the data production centers. And, and we have uh, a few global information system centers which, uh, which are interconnected uh, by a, a, a private network. And uh, the, one of the key uh, rules of those centers is to, to keep, uh, to maintain a, a global uh, catalog of all the meteorological information, uh, what we call metadata about all the data. So each national center, each uh, DCPC, uh, they will, when, when they want to share more data, to, 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 to send the data, uh, to share the data with uh, more, uh, a new type of data with the other countries, they get their metadata on that product or that, that data, new data, registered with one of the global system, global uh, information system centers. So that is the entry for the metadata to be, to be registered, which is crucial. Because with, with, this synchro with the synchronization between those uh, center, those uh, GISCs, we, have, we maintain a, a most up-to-date global catalog of all the information. So if you want to see what kind of uh, information, if you are doing research, if you are doing uh, a, a development of a new, a new uh, data processing uh, uh, systems, you want to get access to the global uh, weather, climate, and, uh, and hydrological data. So you go to one of the uh, GISCs to, 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 to browse into the, uh, the, the, the catalog. Of course, I would, uh, I would admit that uh, it is not uh, that uh, easy to, to, to use. So we are trying to open, the, open this up to, to a much broader um, user community. Uh, as, as we realize that uh, in the past, we have been too much focused on, on professional users. So we now, we now need to open them up. So, well, just uh, a, a quick show of, uh, of how this works. Uh, when a, when a national center, uh, when a data produ producing center want to publish the, the data, they, they get their metadata registered. So that, that uh, uh, new addition uh, is now is synch synchronized among the uh, GISCs uh, immediately. And when the user want to find the data, he goes to the, uh, one of the GISCs and uh, find the uh, description on data. And you can sub subscribe. Uh, once you know what, what kind of data is that, is it? And when a, a, a data, those data producing centers, they supply their uh, metadata to, to get registered, and then uh, they're ready to supply the data service. So a user will access them directly. Of course, there is a data policy issue. The data is still owned by the, the, uh, the, 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 the data center. So, uh, of course, there's a, a data access uh, right. Uh, you, you have to be uh, authenticated if you want to get uh, a steady and uh, uh, the data in an operational way. So there are some uh, operational setups needed, but uh, this is to facilitate the data discovery, access, and retrieval. So just a quick show. So, but now we are faced with a, a, lo a lot of uh, new challenges. Challenges both from the data, from the user community, because uh, we have uh, more and more data. Well, huge, well, big increase in, in data volume and complexity, and user expectations are changing. They, they want to get access to the information and services through common interfaces and applications. So that is enabled by the development of uh, internet, of course. 
and users combine would like to combine a mobile uh, cloud and the social technologies to get access to more information and as we as we can see uh, the common data sharing platforms and technologies are, are becoming uh, a must and changes in data supply patterns and user expectations uh, so as i mentioned earlier so in the meantime we have uh, opportunities uh, web web service cloud technology search engines uh, of course, uh, if you go to Google, you don't uh, get much uh, information on uh, professional uh, meteorological data, uh, which, which is still a problem. So the, we, we, will, we will work with search engines uh, to try to break that barrier so that the public will have, a public user will have a, a much meaningful results when they go to uh, search engines. So that uh, will need us to work with, together with, uh, with uh, 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 search engines like Google and like Bing to make that happen, which is not the case yet. And so uh, other technologies, of course, uh, uh, big data. Uh, we are all talking about big data. So what does big data mean to us? And uh, we, have, uh, we, have, uh, we have to think about this. So with that, WMO started to develop uh, it's a, a new the strategy for the next phase of WMO information system i'm not going to 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 go so in detail about this so basically we are trying to take benefit of uh, of uh, of new technology to address the uh, new requirements of our users to make the uh, our system uh, more open and uh, easier to use so data acquisition, data dissemination. New platform which is more oriented not only to the uh, professional users, but also to the public, to the private uh, partners, as we are talking about. And of course, we will benefit a lot from the development of cloud technology. And we will look at data data and information management issue as well. In the past, we focused very much on the data exchange phase. If you are talking about the life, data, well, life cycle management of information. So we will provide more guidance to our members, to, the, to our user community on how to store, how to maintain your archive, and how even how to dispose of your data, because we cannot uh, afford to keep all data forever. So that's a brief uh, uh, introduction of what we do in WMO as uh, in our effort to, ha to help our members to get data exchanged, to get data described, exchanged, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and managed. So we are trying to, to move, uh, to, to, to do a better job to serve uh, more programs of WMO. In the past, we, we've been uh, very much, uh, I would say, uh, weather-centric, uh, weather forecasting. But now, climate, is, climate uh, applications are posing more challenging uh, 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 questions to us. So let's, let's face them and let's try to address them. And with that, uh, I would uh, leave this uh, on the screen. Uh, so it is a, a proposal from my colleague uh, who, who was not able to come. He regret that very much. So uh, just uh, um, a few uh, l uh, items to be, to be considered for your discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peyang. Th this was really interesting. This must be the first time I hear somebody speaking about planned disposal of data. I've never heard somebody planning that before, and I think, but it, it's, it's a really interesting topic. Um, questions, please. So first, my name is Michael Ogia, um, and I really appreciate both of you, uh, both of you specifically coming and speaking with us. Um, you know, it's not every day that um, anyone in general, much less people in the internet governance community, get to speak with actual you know, meteorological and climate scientists. And um, as a point of 
um, kind of uh, embarrassment. I actually grew up in a climate change denying household. Um, believe it or not. And uh, I've since come a long way. In fact, now I, I mostly work on, I mainly work on sustainability and the sustainability of ICT, etc. cetera. So um, your, your presentations really um, hit a chord with me. And I guess I really wanted to ask you somewhat tangentially, if it's not necessarily related to your presentation, but it is in that it's related to, to data. And that is, how would you recommend in your experience that whenever people, whenever individuals are doubting the data, and whenever people are specifically when it comes to climate change, is it you know, how would you recommend that we necessarily address those um, those points, those that that skepticism of how the what the data is saying and what the, the models are predicting? Yeah, there's no way around uh, taking any concern seriously, no matter whether it's repeatedly issued or whether it has foundation or not. Um, the climate science community has set up numer numerous uh, websites and other outlets to address uh, such such concerns. And people take uh, evenings, evenings and weekends unpaid time to really go into depth again of things they seemed they thought were consensus and and you know re-explain them to to all these concerns uh, it's a major burden on the community and uh, you know, uh, but there's no other way around it um, what uh, we've been doing um, together with UNEP the United Nations Environment Program is to run the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. And that's not just the Secretariat in Geneva, it's actually thousands, three or four thousand scientists uh, around the world from all countries almost, um, coming together, uh, largely unpaid time, and producing massive assessments uh, on the validity of the various data sets. Um, so, you have to go into these reports uh, into some detail then and there is always an executive summary which is easy to read um, but then if you want a more detail you go into the actual reports and you find that uh, they take all these concerns about data quality very very seriously so you would not find a single data point in these reports that does not have an uncertainty attached to it and uh, it is another challenge of us to explain to the public what uncertainty actually means. It's not a doubt about the data, it's just something that is inherent to any measurement governed by the laws of physics. Thank you, I just wanna say thank you so much for all of the wonderful work that you all do. Do we have any other questions in the room? From the room? No. Do we have any remote questions? Then I can ask my questions. One of the questions I had when, if you try to stay close to the internet is, you mentioned that public internet plays a major role in exchanging data today and it has accelerated the whole process of sharing data and then also the, the benefits. Um, you're probably aware of, again, reawakening of discussions of net neutrality. Did you ever perceive this as a possible threat if we lose net neutrality, will that impact your exchange of data? You also mentioned some private networks between JISCs, mm -hmm. so what, what, how do you see this? Well, first of all, by, uh, by a private network, I, I mean uh, a, a network which is different from uh, uh, internet. Or, uh, lease lines. Yeah, lease lines. Uh, well, uh, lease lines, well, uh, uh, Maybe ten years ago, we talked about this design, but now it's it's a close network. It's a, it's a it's a network with a network service with a, a, a level of a service um, service level agreement uh, with the provider. So it's a it's a what internet is is more is, is a kind of VPN. Yes, a kind of VPN or, or a similar technology. So it's a it's a closed network among those uh, highly operational, real-time operational uh, centers. So your your first part of the question is about uh, um, uh, data, uh, well, network neutrality. Uh, how does it mean for 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 uh, for for WMO? 
I, I think I think well as the, the WMO is a, is a small international organization which is a, which is for what with 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 which is strong science and technological background and uh, with the data we are talking well uh, of course uh, uh, climate data are a bit more sens uh, sensitive than than weather data maybe but. Uh, uh, in general, I think I think uh, I think we we would welcome a, a more open network uh, 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 enabled by by the development of uh, of, uh, of uh, internet internet technology, so which is a welcome, welcoming sign for for especially for the global network. Yes, yes, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, when, when I when I when I when I uh, say uh, uh, getting uh, the um, uh, other members connected. Uh, this is our vision uh, uh, for most part of the world, or for, for a large part of the world, okay. this is uh, getting easier. But uh, still, we have uh, those uh, more difficult countries where the national infrastructure, the national technical infrastructure is not that good, and we still have a difficulty, even, even though we have, uh, well, 100 uh, automatic weather stations deployed, and we still have difficulty to get those data in, a, in an operational, well, in real time to to be gathered uh, to their national center so that they will be shared, uh, they will be uh, uh, available to be shared with the rest of the world. So that, uh, that connectivity within that country and between that country with, with, with its neighboring countries, well, internet. So if we have a uh, better access uh, to internet for those uh, uh, national meteorological inf uh, services, which will be uh, help, uh, help, helping a lot to, to improve uh, the, the global global uh, uh, service. Yes, yes. Yeah, regarding the internet, um, so uh, it's it's partly due to the heritage of our organisation that the internet is not yet used to, for real time exchange of data, but it's also because in case of a hurricane striking, the internet tends to go down. <laughs> So you don't want to rely on a system that isn't really designed for working 24-7, even in case of a major disaster, if you want information about the disaster in that, in that moment. So that's, that's why the internet is it's, it's, it's increasingly being used by some countries, um, but the, the, the core networks that we described today are, are, are still largely outside the internet. But, mon but connectivity is crucial because I talked about training. So we organize a lot of distant learning training. People in, rem in you know, developing countries, sometimes they just cannot connect properly to these sessions because the internet is too slow. So that's really where you cannot build capacity if the internet isn't there. So it's not just about the data itself. It's about training. It's about Both other things. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that still, the connectivity still remains the issue despite yes. the progress digital that's been divide. made. That's why I put digital divide. Yes. Unfortunately, we are um, coming to the end of the session. Um, I have some questions. I hope you can stay five minutes sure. <laughs> informally. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you to our speakers. I really enjoyed these presentations, and they were really, there was a lot to learn. And thank you for to Philip and Barbara. And um, enjoy the rest of the day and other sessions. Thanks.